I grew up in India when Indira Gandhi was prime minister. And I saw the example of a really empowered woman. But even though she was leading the country, I also saw that the lives of many women were constrained by lack of education, by social restrictions on what they were allowed to do. Now, India has come a long way since the, that time. But despite this really remarkable progress in many fronts, still in 2008, the literacy rate for women was 51% compared to 75% for men. And that's just one indicator of the gender gap that we find, not just in India, but in so many countries. And that the statistical indicators only tell part of the story. Also, in so many parts of the world, women are restricted from even going outside the house without the permission of a father or husband. And that's one reason why that gender gap is, is an important reason why we still have over 40% of children under five in South Asia are malnourished, are underweight, despite all the increases in agricultural production and incomes that should have wiped out that malnutrition. But as Agnes Kisuming and, and Jemima and Juki have mentioned, this gender gap is really important. We know women play a key role in the welfare of their families. We know that women's empowerment is crucial, not just for the women themselves, but for the, for the food security of their families, for the care of, and education of their children, and for ending the transmission of poverty from one generation to the other. But across the world, we still see that women are less educated, have fewer resources, and are restricted in what they can do. Okay. That's enough about why uh, gender and empowerment of women is important. Now I want to focus on how it can be done. It isn't easy. The deck is stacked against women, especially poor women. Not only do their households not have a lot of income or assets, but the women within those households who are often expected to feed the family have even less control over those resources. Let me give an example of one woman from a Bangladeshi village in the vegetable program that Agnes Kisumbing has studied. She lives with her husband and two daughters and with his family. He is an agricultural laborer and sharecropper. They don't own any land. She can't read or write. When she was 14 years old, she was married, and following custom, she moved from her home village to her husband's, and she's pretty much cut off from her, her family. When her husband got ulcers and required surgery, the family went into debt. Now, she doesn't have education no land for collateral, uh, restrictions on, on even going outside the house to earn income. What's she to do? Fortunately, her story is one of the more positive ones. First, her friends helped her out, and her neighbors helped contribute to meet the immediate expenses. Then she joined a microfinance group and was able to get a loan to pay off those, those family debts. Because very often in Bangladesh, women's income and assets are used for, for the uh, health expenses in the family. Then when she paid that off, she was able to get another microfinance loan from the group to uh, get a cow. And that milk helps feed her daughters, but also to uh, earn some extra income. She's now hoping that her daughters are going to graduate from high school, go all the way through. But it's been both formal and informal collective action that's made the difference for her. While individually, women like her 
have few options. Collectively, they can achieve a lot for poverty reduction and create social change. Whether it's through group-based microfinance, or improved vegetable garden programs, or mark in Bangladesh, or markets in Malawi, we see that together women can do things that they can't do by themselves. They can improve their families and the world around them. But how does this happen? First, the group creates solidarity. Women help each other. Taking the, the well-known cases of microfinance that we hear about a lot, the, the first step is often that women come together and pledge to save just a small amount each week. But that sort of group pressure makes sure that that saving gets set aside and put in a safe place. Then they vouch for each other on loans. And when you don't have other assets for collateral, that social capital is really important. Then women help each other. They often set up revolving uh, funds for emergencies. Insurance, when there are no other forms available. Second, it's often socially more acceptable for women to do things in a group than for one woman to do it by herself. For example, these Muslim women in Nigeria are restricted in their ability to go outside the home. But it is acceptable to come together to learn the Quran. So they come together to do that. And then they've started a savings association. And they've been able to do other things together. Learn about nutrition, for example. These women are what are running a concession stand at a park, something that's normally reserved for men in India. It also applies for getting land. It's often very difficult for a poor woman to get land by herself, but she may be able to participate in a collective garden, or in this case, a cooperative tree nursery on government land in India. And government and non-government programs often reach out to women's groups as a way of, an effective way of reaching large numbers of people. India alone has literally millions of self-help groups that are supported by government or non-government organizations. This is a landless women's group in a watershed program in India that makes organic pesticides out of plants that they gather on the commons. Being in a group helps break women's isolation and reinforces their bargaining power within the household, the community, and society. This is a women's uh, group in a slum housing association that argues for tenure security. So this isn't just a rural issue. <coughs> the Self-Employed Women's Association of India illustrates some of the potential of these kinds of groups. Now, the self-employed women that we're talking about are the street vendors, the agricultural day laborers, literally some of the poorest of the poor. They came together in 1972 and formed first a uh, trade union. It's now grown to over one and a quarter million members in India. They've expanded into financial services, both savings, loans, and really innovative insurance programs. They help in marketing their products. Social services like education, childcare, and adult literacy. Infrastructure, improving the water the housing, the sanitation, electricity, and transportation in their communities. Building enterprises and capacity, including like technical skills and leadership training. The really key thing here is that women themselves are setting the agenda and solving problems that are important to them. There are other examples. If we go to Kenya, many of you have heard about the Green Belt Movement. Wangari Maathai won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2004 for her work with this. What started out as a grassroots women's tree planting movement to address deforestation and soil erosion has expanded into a really powerful civil society movement ad advocating for peaceful democratic change through protection of the environment. But it's not just these big cases that are important. 
Sometimes it's the small, even informal groups that really make a difference. Like this women's craft group in Mabira Forest in Uganda. Not only does that provide skill training for, uh, for widows and earning income, but improves relations with the government. These women's only groups, though, can have limitations. In some contexts, the women don't have all the skills that are needed, and involving men can really help. This is, for example, a mixed group for watershed planning in Kenya. By the same token, women have a lot to offer to other types of organizations that are often dominated by men. Jemima Njuki took me to this watershed group, which she was studying as part of her dissertation. And in her dissertation, she was finding that mixed groups were more effective than all male or all female. When we were introduced to the members, a woman was a secretary. I mean, it was, secretary is often the role that women are in. But this woman was the treasurer. So I asked, why did they pick a treasurer that was a woman? And everybody kind of laughed and said, women can be trusted with money. And I've actually heard that answer quite often since then. And it's not just with things like that. In managing natural resources, if women are the ones who are, are collecting water or in the forest, they can monitor the condition of the resource on a daily basis. And we can get more effective resource management. Women and men have often complementary knowledge and skills like in this, uh, about seeds in this Central American uh, agricultural innovation group. Now these mixed sex groups can be extremely effective, but they don't work everywhere. Uh, setting them up can take more effort than doing all male or all female groups. And women's voices can be lost in these mixed groups, so you have to take care as needed. Uh, now, there are, uh, anytime somebody is telling you that a simple question to a development problem, get suspicious. It probably is that simple. So, there are, are limitations. I'm not telling you that women's groups are a panacea. First, there are the time constraints. If you want a laugh, just ask any mother of young kids what she does in her spare time. Right? You've been there. <laughs> and that's even more true for poor women in developing countries because they're collecting firewood and water and doing all the household chores, trying to maybe grow some food, earn some income to feed their families. They may not have the time for meetings or other collective activities, especially when they don't, aren't sure it's going to make a difference. When we were setting up water user associations for women in India, uh, no, in Sri Lanka, this woman said, why should I go to the meeting? It's, in, during that period, I could, I could roll 50 beauties, these are small cigarettes, and earn money, and what I do in the meeting won't make a difference anyway. That takes me to the next thing. What are the incentives? What motivation do they have to put in the time and contribute? Do they really think it's going to make a difference? Who sets the priorities? Women, men, or outsiders? Is that woman in the back going to be listened to? Women's groups often miss out the poorest women as well. In a microfinance group, you don't necessarily want to include somebody who may not pay back her loans but the women themselves may not want to participate. They feel they don't have the education or the skills to go. In a study in Uganda, we were asking what assets are important. Over and over, it was good clothes. Now that may sound vain or trivial, but you need decent clothes to go to a meeting and be accepted. Finally, it's important not to overload the expectations of these. I really get nervous when I hear all these things that are going to be done by women's self-help groups. When you get overloaded, the collective action can often break down. 
And these women's groups can't do everything on their own. It takes a, it takes a village to empower women as well as to raise a child. You need to build that community support. Mixed sex groups can be really effective but that may take more time. What, in terms of government programs, when they go in, having a gender lens can really be important. So, when they're uh, um, setting up a program, if you, uh, this was a case in Cambodia where it was a community resource management program in floodplains, and they were doing a community mapping exercise. The government official did not think that it was um, the women would contribute much to the mapping. But to humor me, he said, well, we could have a separate women's mapping group. I think he was really surprised that the women produced a much more detailed map because they put on the resources that were important to them that were being overlooked by outsiders and even by the men in the community. So listening to their voice is important. I don't say that empowering women is easy or that there's one solution. But we do see important gains and transformations as women come together and go get strength in numbers. Together, women can do things they can't do by themselves. If we go back to our analogy of igniting change, it may be better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. But how much better yet to light a whole candelabra, to set ablaze real change for women, their families, their communities, and society at large. 